Hello, my name's Anna Frankham, and in this session I'm going to cover the impact of Brexit on contract law, intellectual property and data protection. The good news is that there will be no massive legal change to contract law on Brexit Day. Consumer rights are also unlikely to change in the short term. However, as you know, there is uncertainty about various issues relating to trade between the UK and the EU 27 after Brexit. So we'll look at imports and exports, supply chain issues, some contractual points and changes to trademarks, designs and data protection. Looking first at imports and exports, the supply of goods is mainly governed by UK laws such as the Sale of Goods Act. And these laws won't change after Brexit. Also, the European Withdrawal Act 2018 means that most EU laws that exist at the date of Brexit will be transferred directly into UK law. The government will probably change some of those over time, but that will take time. So the main effects of Brexit on business contracts will be price fluctuations, increased delivery costs and changes in import and export licences, tariffs and VAT rules. UK businesses which export goods to the EU will need to get an Economic Operator Registration Identification Number or EORI number for short and it will start with GB. If you need one of these and you haven't got one already you can apply online. EU businesses which import goods from the UK will need an EU number so you should check that your importer has one. They can get one from the customs authority in their own country. You'll also need an EU EORI number if you're exporting to your own business in the EU, for example, if you have a subsidiary in France. Goods exported to the EU after Brexit will need to be labelled with the details of your importer in the EU. You'll also need to complete customs declarations for goods you export to or import from the EU. This can be quite complicated, but you can use a freight forwarder or a customs agent to do it for you if you prefer. You can make it easier to import goods from the EU in a no-deal Brexit by registering for what's called Transitional Simplified Procedures and you can do this online. This will delay your customs declaration and payment of import duties and VAT. As to tariffs, if the UK leaves without a deal, it will have to apply VAT and customs and excise duties on goods traded within the EU. The UK will be treated like any other non-EU country. However, the UK has introduced a temporary regime for up to 12 months so that the duties applied to most goods imported into the UK from the EU will be 0%. After that period, if there's still no deal, the World Trade Organisation rules will apply. However, when exporting goods to the EU after Brexit, your importer in the EU will need to pay tax and duty. Also, in a no-deal Brexit, you won't be able to use HMRC's online VAT service to claim a VAT refund from an EU member state. Each EU country has its own process for refunding VAT and you can find out what the process is for each country on the European Commission website. We'll include links to these websites in the pack which accompanies the webinar. If your business will be transporting goods within the EU after Brexit, you should make sure that your drivers and your own company has the necessary licences, permits and other documents. So looking now at supply chains, if you import goods from the EU or export there, we recommend that if you haven't already done this, you review your supply chain for potential risks. Ideally, this should include all the parties in the supply chain because Issues affecting businesses either up or down the supply chain may have a serious knock-on effect to your business. You may want to consider the following risks with your suppliers. Increases in costs, including goods and parts and fees and licences. The risk of products and components or parts not being available. The risk of employee shortages in the UK. Increases in time or cost of going through customs and exchange rate volatility and VAT complications. Some of these risks are difficult to prepare for, such as customs delays, but you could consider three top tips. Firstly, draw up a plan to ensure that you can communicate quickly and easily with other businesses in your supply chain.
Secondly, consider expanding your supplier network to multiple suppliers to offset the risk of one key supplier failing. And lastly, review your contracts to consider who bears the risks in Brexit related scenarios. On that last point, you should first make sure that you have signed contracts in place with your key suppliers and customers. And then if you haven't already done so, check those contracts for key points such as the term of the contract, when is it due to expire, when each party can terminate and in what circumstances, because you might want to terminate early. Does the contract refer to the EU as the territory for the, for the contract? If so, that needs to be clarified to ensure that the UK is still covered by the contract. What's the currency? Because there could be big changes in the exchange rates if the pound falls. Who pays the tariffs and who deals with customs clearances? And are there any transfers of personal data from the EU to the UK? Finally, how will disputes be settled? You might also want to consider adding another clause to your contracts to enable you to renegotiate or terminate post-Brexit. This might be a hardship clause, a price variation clause or a supplier priority clause. Force majeure clauses have been discussed elsewhere in the webinar. I'll just briefly discuss each one of those three clauses. A hardship clause aims to manage a situation where one party to the contract suffers a predefined event which causes them hardship. This might be caused by a change in prices or a shortage in product availability. And that might make the contract unprofitable or unreasonably burdensome for that party. A hardship clause can allow that party to renegotiate or terminate the contract early. A price variation clause allows for a variation to be triggered by a particular event, such as an increase in the price of materials or import tariffs or a big change in exchange rates. And finally, a priority clause would protect a party if the supplier only has a limited amount of the product available. The clause would ensure that that particular customer would be prioritised over the supplier's other customers. It is possible that one party or the other might claim that a contract has been frustrated by Brexit. In other words, it's become impossible to perform and it should be terminated. But the bar for frustration is very high and a contract isn't frustrated just because it's become more expensive or more difficult to perform. Also, Brexit must not have been contemplated by the parties at the time when the contract was signed. So any contract entered into from 2016 onwards is unlikely to be considered to have been frustrated as a result of Brexit. I'll talk now about intellectual property rights such as trademarks and designs. This part will be mainly relevant to manufacturers and distributors. In brief, the current EU-wide IP rights will no longer cover the EU after Brexit, but they will of course continue to cover the remaining 27 member states. These rights include EU trademarks, registered community designs and unregistered community designs. If you own any of these rights, the UK will provide equivalent protection in the UK automatically and free of charge, whether a withdrawal agreement is reached or not. However, if you have a pending application for either an EU trademark or a registered community design at the date of Brexit, you will need to reapply in the UK and there will be a nine month window in which you can do that. Finally, just a word on the exhaustion of IP rights. Currently, when a product sold anywhere in the EEA, the trademark or the other IP rights in the product are deemed to be exhausted. And that means that a product can be resold anywhere else in the EEA, including in the, e in the UK, without infringing the IP rights in it. In a no-deal scenario, the UK will continue to recognise EEA exhaustion for at least a temporary period, but the EU isn't going to reciprocate. So in practice, the, this means that the IP rights in goods, which are placed on the market initially in the UK, will not be exhausted in the EEA. So you might need to obtain consent from the rights owner to sell those products in EEA countries, and obviously that could lead to delays in your supply. Turning to data protection, in a no-deal scenario, there would be no immediate change to data protection requirements in the UK. This is because the UK has already implemented a Data Protection Act which mirrors the GDPR. 
However, after Brexit, the UK will be what's known as a third country, which means that unless the EU decides that the UK offers adequate protection for personal data, any transfers of personal data from the EU to the UK can only be made if there are what's known as appropriate safeguards. So in short, if your business needs to receive personal data from a business in the EU, you will normally need to sign some standard contractual clauses with that business. This data might be, for example, payroll information from a subsidiary, or it might be contact details for customers and suppliers who are located in the EU. Thank you very much for listening.